Hey guys, Paul Reddick here. Welcome to the Baseball Dads Podcast. Let me ask you a few questions. Does your son throw well in a pitching lesson, but can't seem to take that same level of performance with them into a game? Do their pitches look really crisp, really pretty during a lesson, but don't seem to have the same effect in a game as they had in a lesson? Does your son have a level of focus and concentration during a lesson, but can't seem to bring that into the pressure-filled situations that he's called upon as a pitcher? Well, in this podcast, I'm going to tell you exactly why your son performs one way in a lesson, another way in a game, because we're going to talk about the tricks that pitching coaches use during pitching lessons. So this is a unique podcast for me because I'm a pitching coach. Right. And for a number of years, for a long time, I've I gave pitching lessons. And and unfortunately, early on, when I was a young coach, I did a lot of these things. And and the only reason I know that these things don't work is because we changed the way that we instruct pitchers based on them. So let's let's get right into them. When you do a pitching lesson, the first thing the pitching coach will do is isolate you. And which is very funny to me because in, in team sports, maybe the only comparable position would be a quarterback, a football quarterback, where there's more attention on a single position in team sports than there is a pitcher. But where do pitching lessons tend to happen? They tend to happen in a bullpen. They tend to happen in a pitching tunnel in an academy or off to the side in an academy or they happen in a gym, right? They tend to happen all alone which already starts to change the whole effect of what we're doing is when we isolate the pitcher and get him all alone. The second thing that we do is once we have him all alone, I can talk faster than the pitcher can think. And so what I can do as a pitching coach is I can give him the thoughts to think. I can control what he focuses on. I can control the the thoughts that go through his head. I can control where his state of mind goes, where his flows, where his energy goes. I can stand there and talk to him faster than he can think so I can give him the thoughts to think. So just those two things, right? If we think about the position of pitcher where you're the center of attention and you're kind of out there all alone, and what do we know about a pitcher? That his mind, right? A pitcher gets beat in his mind more times than a hitter beats him. So now if I'm a pitching coach and I can get you all alone and I can give you the thoughts to have, I've I've completely taken you out of anything of what it's like to play a game. Now, we're going to talk later about the right way to do this. Of course, there has to be a time for instruction, but there's also got, we got to balance that out. We're going to talk about that later. The third thing a pitching coach can do is I can cue you. And this is where pitching coaches, uh, where they really kind of screw this up. And I get it. I totally get it. I get the pressure that's on pitching coaches these days because there's a pressure now, especially with the money being thrown around, there's a pressure to get the kid to perform in a lesson to feel good. But remember, our job as instructors is not to get the player to feel good. Our job is to make them good. Now, I get it. There's more pressure on the pitching performances there is today with the advent of tournament baseball. Um, You know, more artificial pressure put on the kids. So there's more pressure on the pitching coach to get that kid walking out of that lesson, feeling good, and maybe with this false sense of confidence. But you just gave them a placebo, and we know that. So here's how I... And I'll just admit this uh, on this podcast. I can get your kid to throw a strike. If you want your kid to throw strikes in a lesson, if he's having control problems, I can 100% get him to throw strikes. And it's going to go into into the number four thing, uh, but I can slow him down and I can cue him. So if he's, let's say he's missing up and in, to, to, you know, for right-handed pitcher, missing up and in, no problem. Throw it to the right shin guard of the catcher. And you know where that ball will end up? That ball will end up right over the plate. And I've got you know a dozen other one of those that we use. I can cue a kid to throw a strike. Now you might be asking, is that not useful? Is that not good information to have during a game if my kid's not throwing strikes to be able to change maybe what he's aiming at in order to bring it into the plate? Well, it's kind of like curing a golf slice by you know turning the other way, and that's a good in the moment fix. Yes, if your kid's having control problems in the middle of the game adjust it yes adjust it do whatever you have to do to compete in that game but that's not what you're there that's not what you came for a pitching lesson to do you didn't come to a pitching lesson to perform you didn't come to a pitching lesson to be cued so that you throw a strike so that it looks good in the lesson and the dad feels like he got his money's worth because the kid now was throwing a ball and now he's throwing a strikes and it looks like the the pitching coach laid hands on him and healed him that's not what happened all he did was put a band-aid and advil over that problem. Now, let me say this. The reason why pitching coaches are giving out Band-Aids and Advil is because parents are coming in and asking for Band-Aids and Advil. Parents are not coming in asking, can you make my son 
a long-term successful pitcher? Can you lay a foundation of functional strength mechanics, strategy, and tactics for my and pitches for my son so that he can have a career where he pitches at least till he's 18? And if God gave him more than that beyond that, can you do that for my son? Can you lay that solid foundation for my son? Parents are not asking that. And that's why pitching coaches have to resort to this stuff. What pitching coaches are doing, they're handing out Band-Aids and Advil because parents are asking for Band-Aids and Advil. Parents are coming in and saying, you got to get my kid ready. He's got a tournament in two weeks. He needs to add three miles per hour. He needs to add two pitches and he's not throwing strikes. And I need, uh, we have time to do three or four or five lessons in between there and you have to cure him. So now the pitching coach starts implementing these tricks. And here's what happens. The pitching coach implements some tricks. The kid feels good. The dad feels good because the kid feels good. The kid feels, I never threw like that before in my life. And then the dad feels like he got his money worth. The pitching coach got paid. And here's the problem. The more that system works for the pitching coach, the more he is going to market that. They're selling Band-Aids and Advil because that's what parents are coming in and asking for. Go in, and and this is a two-part episode. We're going to talk about how to pick a pitching coach later. But you have to make sure that you're laying a great foundation and not just duct taping your son's pitching career. So the fourth thing that pitching coaches can do is stop at any time. So I can slow you down if, you're, if your mind's out of control. I can slow you down, put the right thoughts in. I could slow you down and cue you. I can stop and talk to you for two minutes. I can't do that in a game. I can't do that in a game. I don't, I don't know how long pitching you know, mound visits are, what the official ruling is, right? But they're not, they're not long, right? A minute or so. I don't have that amount of time to talk, but I can do it. I could stop in a lesson. If you're out of control, I could stop. If you're losing control, I could calm you down. I could talk to you. I could get you refocused. I could put my thoughts in your head. I can cue you and get all those things because I have time on my side. The fifth thing they do is they've taken out the hitter, the umpire, the situation of the game, the pressure of the game, the type of game, tournament, championship, elimination game. They've taken out the crowds. They've taken out the other team barking at you. They've taken off the kid that's on deck that's got two doubles off of you. They've taken out your mom sitting in the stands or your girlfriend at the game. They've taken out all the hard parts of pitching, all of the hard parts. That's why you look good. They took out all the hard parts. So think about it. You're alone. You're in isolation. They took out the attention. They're going to get in your head. They're going to give you their thoughts. They're going to take out the part that your mind has to work on by itself. They're going to cue you. They're just going to duct tape and put band-aids over it. They can stop at any time, which you can't do at a game. And they took out the hitter, the umpire, the crowd, the situation, and all the other stuff. They took, out, they took out everything that's hard about pitching. And what they've taken away is the is uh, the the objective of pitching is to compete and get hitters out. That's the objective of pitching. The objective of pitching is not to throw pretty pitches. But once we the, the, the last thing that we do is that we change the success measurement in a lesson. So success in a lesson is throwing strikes, throwing pretty pitches, and feeling confident. That are the six, those are the success measurements in a lesson. Throwing strikes, throwing pretty pitches, feeling confident. The only problem is, is throwing strikes and throwing pretty pitches and feeling confident in those things and bringing confidence off of those two things is not your objective as a pitcher. Your objective of a pitcher is to get hitters out. Yes, you got to throw strikes, but how many times do we see balls that we are thrown in a lesson right over the plate? Wow, right over the plate. Great pitch. And we know in a game that would get absolutely smoked, but it looks good in a lesson because we took out all the hard parts. I always use this as an example. I have a heavy bag down in my basement and, um, I use it to work out, you know, nothing serious. Um, but I bet you I look awesome on that thing. I'm landing punches, you know. And, but here's the thing. I took out all the hard parts. I, I, I don't move. I generally keep my feet, you know, a little bit of movement. But I'm not, like, moving around a ring. So I took out the endurance. I don't know if my punches are good or not or landing. I don't know. I don't know. I get no feedback if my punches are good. And there's not a guy there trying to hit me. So if we are not educating our pitchers on the objective at hand, which is to get hitters out, which sometimes is not always to throw pretty pitches. Because a lot of times a pitching coach will look at a curveball and, right, and they'll look at the, oh, you see the movement on that thing? Oh, 
It was unbelievable. What movement on that thing? Well, guess what? You know, the dad is going, oh, that thing broke like crazy. And the pitching coach, oh, that's great. And the, and the pitcher's like, that's great. But you know what? If I can see it, and you can see it, and dad can see it, and the guess who else can see it? It's not going to be that great of a pitch to a hitter. The last thing a pitching coach do, will do is if you do all those things and you threw strikes and you threw pretty pitches and you have a feeling of confidence, they'll tell you you did a good job. They'll tell you it's good. They'll tell you that what you have now is what you need and that's just not always the case. What you have is you just worked on the act of throwing strikes or throwing pitches. You didn't work on pitching. You didn't work on getting hitters out. And even situational, right? Isn't it funny how we do like, uh, um, I, I used to do this all the time, situational counts. Right, and we used to do it based on called balls and strikes. That's a strike. That's a ball. You struck him out. No, you didn't strike him out. You just threw three pitches that we called strikes. It's no different than a carnival game, right? There's if there's no hitter in there and there's nobody giving you feedback, then it's 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 just a carnival game. It's just a, it's just a trick. So the last thing we do is, is the pitching coach usually removes all other options. The problem that we have today in the pitching world is that when your kid struggles with location, struggles with command, struggle with pitches, or maybe has a little pain, or his mechanics are tweaked, or something like that, you guys all go to the pitching coach. That's the first person you go to. It's probably not the person that you should go to. Um, we, so we're going to talk about the four pillars of, of pitching success in another podcast. But I'm going to tell you that if you're struggling with with command and control, which means that his mechanics are inconsistent, which means there's something going on in his body over the over the course of a season. Um, you know, there's going to be wear and tear on your body. Your body's going to get out of alignment. You you probably your first stop if your kid's having control command and control problems is not your pitching coach because here's what your pitching coach is going to do: this get him all alone, get his thought. He's going to go through all these things, right? And he's just going to manipulate him to throw strikes and the less he's going to feel good and not be good. Your best bet is to probably bring him to an athletic trainer or a physical therapist or someone that can assess his body to make sure that there's nothing wrong. Because more times than not, when I see pitchers, I don't see pitchers that have a mechanical flaw that we're just going to work out. I see pitchers that have something wrong in their body. And I know enough to be dangerous in that area. And I, here's the thing is I know enough to know when I don't have the solution. And most of the time, the pitching coach is not your solution. Most times you need to get with a medical professional who knows what they're doing, who can assess the body and can look at what's going on. Because a lot of times mechanical things are something's tight, something's tweaked, something's sore, something's inflamed, or maybe there's some pain there. They're working around. They alter the mechanics to get around a little discomfort. And so if a kid's got like a jammed up ankle or a tight muscle or something like that, I'm not qualified to, to uh, relieve the tension in that muscle. I'm not, I'm not qualified to release that. But I have a network of people who are. We'll talk about in the next podcast on how to pick a pitching coach. And those are the people that I'm, I'm going to send my pitcher to. Because now if that, if that physical therapist or that athletic trainer can get him right, now he can actually do the instruction that I want him to do. So a lot of times pitching coaches will eliminate all other opinions. So number one, they get you all alone. Number two, they get in your head. Number three, they cue you. Number four, they can stop at any time. Number five, they take out all the hard parts. They change the success, success measurement. They told you that it did good, and they usually eliminate a lot of other opinions and a lot of other solutions for you. So what do you do now? So here's the thing you do. There is a time that there's got to be instruction in a lesson, right, where you're working on things and you're developing skills. Um, but every pitching coach should combine uh, some level of functional strength training with their instruction. If you are just going to pitching lessons, um, you, you're just not getting what you need. You need to have someone who's going, or you need to have a, a pitching coach and a strength coach working together um, in this area. Um, the functional strength is going to be the ability of your son to re repeat mechanics over and over again, you know, 80 to 100 times a game every fifth day for six to nine months. The mechanics are just kind of how he's going to move. So a pitching coach has to have, a, you have to work in conjunction with a strength coach and or a physical therapist. We'll talk about that in the, in the part two of this podcast uh, on how to pick a pitching coach. Um, but in, in the actual pitching lesson itself, yeah, there are some things you want to work on just to touch up your pitches. It's like shoot around, right? That there's, there's if you walk a basketball team goes out on the field on the field out on the court right they shoot some layups they shoot some small three pointers right they shoot some things but they just don't chuck up shots with nobody contesting them what you'll always see is that the great players after they kind of warm up and they got their shots down they've hit some three pointers hit some foul shots hit some layups they have somebody come out and contest them 
right? Because getting them to just to hit shot after shot after shot is not, you know, that's that's just kind of, that's the same thing about just throwing strikes. It feels good, but it's not going to be effective when you take it to the game. So there's got to be a part of the lesson where there is some form of a hitter in there. And when I say some form of a hitter, I'm not, I would love to have live there should be a live portion of every lesson. I, I just believe that. I think that there should be you throwing to a hitter and that hitter is trying to get a hit off you and you are trying to get a hitter out. Now, I have pitching coaches that scream the top of their lungs. I would never put my my pitcher in front of a hitter because it might lose, might shake his confidence. What? So you're telling me you want to give him a false sense of confidence just by throwing arbitrary pitches in a bullpen that just look pretty, but not show him how those pitches are going to work in a game against a live hitter? What if what he just worked on is going to get ripped in a game? Now, some pitching coaches will say, I just don't have live hitters. You know, or I don't have the setup, or there's cage time and mound time. I get that. Okay, if you don't have a hitter to hit live, have a hitter stand in. And this is when the pitching coach backs off and you let the pitcher perform. So think about it like a race car. What if you were tuning up a race car and you were fixing a race car and you're working on, I don't know, the shocks, the wheels and tires, whatever, the motor, right? Do you just go, well, I turned it on and it works and it should be good. No, after they fix that race car, they put that sucker on the track. They take it out for a few laps. They just don't say it's good and walk away. So you got to take it out for a few laps after you work on something. Even if you just have a hitter stand in there and talk to the hitter, the hitter will tell, you'll tell by the hitter's eyes, you'll tell by the hitter's body language if they thought that was a pitch that was going to get ripped or a pitch that was, that was a good pitch. You will see that. Talk to the hitter. If they say, oh, that pitch, I would have teed off on that pitch. Or I saw that you were throwing a curveball because you kind of bent you kind of bent your back. I, I, I picked up your changeup because you fiddled with it in your glove. This, this is the kind of stuff that's going to make us good and not just make us feel good. Put a helmet on him. Have him stand there with a bat. If you don't want to have him stand there with a bat, have him stand there with a glove. There, or if one you know comes, he can just catch it. Um, but have him stand there and talk to the hitter. Get feedback from the actual person that you are trying to get out. Another analogy I always use when I talk to coaches about this is, can you imagine if you trained as a police officer and all you did was learn how to cuff people and learn how to shoot and learn how to drive like, you know, a police officer, but you never practiced that kind of in any kind of like real scenario. So if you learn how to interrogate someone, did they just teach you like, oh, here's the things you say to interrogate, you know, a, a, a suspect, or did they put some people in there to game it with you, to game it with you? Do they take you into field testing? Do you just shoot at the at the at the range and just shoot at a target, or do they put you in situations where you got to go into a, you know like a, a mock house or a, or a situation that you have to respond to? At some point, you've got to practice these things against the opponent. So, pretty fired up on this one. It's it's because I care about it, honestly. I really do. And and the thing is this. There's some great pitching coaches out there that have reduced themselves to putting on a performance for you guys. Um, like I said, I, I think some of them are to blame, but I think the parents share equal blame. They share equal blame. Like I said, they're, they are selling Band-Aids and um, Advil because you're going in and asking for that. And we're going to talk about in the next, in part two of this podcast, how to pick a pitching coach. But um, that is the way it's going, guys. I mean, I'm telling you that... that uh, pitching coaches are kind of saying, well, this is what you want. Okay, well, here you go. And you feel good about it. And, you know, and it's kind of what it is. I get it. And these guys are trying to make a living. You know, I get that too. So they've kind of got that pressure on them to, um, you know, to keep their business going. And it's kind of like if everybody comes in and, and asks for hot dogs and you got hamburgers and, and or you're, you're there with a salad saying hot dogs no good for you. Here's a salad. And be like, yeah, I don't want salad. I get it. You know, I get it, but we can be better. We can be a lot better. And we're going to talk about how to pick a pitching coach. And then later, and, and I do a lot of training for pitching coaches too on how to approach this because there is a way to approach it where if you can just get through this initial, there's just this initial part where um, 
you got it is a little bit of education to do with the parents but if you could just push through that initial part they will start to see better results if you do it um, in a way that really helps them with the objective of getting hitters out um, and, and you'll have more business than you know what to do with. So I'm going to wrap up this episode, Baseball Dads Podcast, and uh, we're going to start with part two. We're going to come back and we're going to do part two of how now to pick a pitching coach because there are some fantastic ones out there. You just have to find them. So I'll see you guys on the next podcast. Thanks.